ഓം ത്രയംബകം യജാമഹേ സഗന്ധി പുഷ്ടിവാർദ്ധനം പൂർവാരുകമിവ ബന്ധന മൃത്യോർമുക്ഷിയമൃത I offer myself in freedom and all of you in freedom to the infinite Lord. May he give you enlightenment, may he release you from all bondage. There is an interesting passage in here. It's rather an unusual one, but I used to ask my guru all kinds of unusual questions, you might say. You see, the goal of the spiritual path, in a sense, is getting rid of all desires and realizing that you are complete in God. Once you, if you have even one desire, you will have to come back. As also in the astral world, my guru used to say sort of jokingly, if you like curry, you have to come back to India. If you like mashed potatoes, you may have to be born in America. Um, if you like uh, uh, cars, you have to come where there are cars. If you like smoking, you have to go where there's smoke. You can't satisfy those desires in the astral world. So we have to get rid of desire. And this seems to many people to be sort of a, a path of a, a rather a bleak path. What they don't understand is that it's, uh, well, think of the story of uh, um, Gulliver and his travels. He landed on the island of Lilliput. There this huge giant was stretched out on the beach. He just been shipwrecked up on that island and they didn't know this huge giant whether he would be a monster and swallow them all or what so they wanted to tie him down and make sure of, of uh, their safety but the largest cords they had the largest cables they had were like little threads to Gulliver and so they had to tie him with many many hundreds of little threads then he couldn't move And then when they were assured that he was a, a friend to them and had wished them no ill, then they released him. Now think of it in reverse. One little desire needn't tie you down all that much. But millions of little desires, you're pretty well bound. What we need to do is two things. One, cut those desires that we see, but we don't see all kinds of them because they're all in the subconscious mind. That's why... Uh, no matter how you work at getting rid of desires, it will take forever that way. The real way is to, as my guru used to say, if you're in a room, if you've been in a room in darkness for a thousand years, you won't get, out, get rid of the darkness by beating at it with a stick. Turn on the light, the darkness will vanish as if it had never been. And so it is if you just come to God, Become one with him, realize his light, realize his joy, realize Om as the reality of your being. Then you will find that it, it doesn't take nearly so long. My guru used to say that the spiritual path is 25% your effort, 25% the guru's effort on your part, on your behalf, I should say, and 50% the grace of God. So... Anyway, thinking this, and because I was a, a one to sort of uh, ask a lot of questions, I asked him a question here that may have come to your mind. I don't know. Sir, if the thing that keeps us bound to this world is worldly desires, why don't those who commit suicide become liberated? Obviously, considering the extreme measures they've adopted to escape this world, they have no desire to remain in it. The master chuckled as he contemplated this seeming paradox. But there must also, he replied, be a positive desire for God. So you see, it isn't just giving up. It's also adopting. It's taking on. You give up desires, you'll never really overcome it. People who commit suicide, yes, they get a little rest in the astral world for a time because they've, they've, uh, uh, they're tired of this world, they're sick of it, and so they... They want to be released from it for a while, but after a while, those desires begin to pick up again. And what happens then is because they wanted rest, they aren't allowed to be reborn. And then maybe they're reborn, but they're still born. Maybe when they are born again, 
and manage to live, they may die while they're still children. And then they may have, they may have to live with insomnia for many years. These are the ways that God has and karma has of making you really appreciate the body that you've been given. Yes, it's a stepping stone to something higher, but don't despise it. We have been given this body that we might grow through this body. Don't ever despise the works of God. Don't despise what God has given you. This body is a sacred vehicle. It's not something to be despised and looked down on, treated badly. Um, that's why I, my guru's way was so beautiful, because he said, enjoy everything with the joy of God. See God in all. And I remember one disciple of his said to us, because something at a restaurant had come that we hadn't ordered, and she said, well, what comes of itself, let it come, as Master said, <laughs> the good things anyway. I said, wait a minute, to myself, I didn't want to correct her. That's not the truth. It should be the bad things that come of themselves that we welcome also. Let everything come that comes. And you will find that when you have that freedom, so that you can't avoid the stings and slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and all the uh, hardships of life. You can't avoid them. They come. Don't say, oh, I want this and I don't want that. You're stuck in delusion if you do. Just say, whatever God gives me, I accept it. Don't be partial in your mind. Don't feel that you want this thing and refuse that. Re accept even blame. When people blame you, don't feel that you've got to come to your defense. Let it be. It's your, your karma being paid off. It's God teaching you to remain centered in yourself. Guruji would sometimes give us good tests that way just to help us to be even-minded under all circumstances. I remember one time we were out of the desert. <clears throat> he had a retreat at 29 Palms, which is desert land. And uh, he, we were making a swimming pool. I never saw him use that swimming pool. In fact, it was uh, not possible to swim in it because you couldn't empty it. Anyway, it was his way of keeping us out there. That's the way I understood it. So that we'd have an excuse to be near him because then he could be with us and we could have satsang. And uh, as a result of our digging out, Norman and I, a very big man, and me, not so big, and we would dig up these, this uh, swimming pool area until we'd, then we'd take it with, with wheelbarrows, and the desert was, around us was covered with all these little mounds of dirt. And uh, Master came out one time, just about lunchtime, when we were starting to feel pretty hungry. And he said, well, let's see if we can't level out those mounds. They don't look very nice. And he said, let's get, get a two-by-four. So Norman went and fetched a two-by-four, and he had a stand at each end of the two-by-four. And then he said, okay, now move it back and forth and pull the dirt toward you and see if we can't level it. And uh, it was not such easy work. Sand is pretty heavy when you just have to work with it instead of it seeing it blown by the wind. And... Uh, um, I thought, well, he'll be satisfied, this is possible, and then let us go to lunch. Oh, no. Oh, that was very good. Let's see if we can do it again. And uh, we did it again. He said, oh, I thought that would work. Let's try another one. And just another, and just another. After a few times, Norman, who was a giant of a man, he was, <sighs> and he was really panting. And uh, I, uh, naturally, it was harder on me with not my, a less strong body. But at a certain point, you know, you reach a point where uh, when life tests you, you either break or you laugh. Well, at a certain point, I just stood up and laughed, and Master smiled, and he said, I was playing with you. All right, now have your lunch. In those ways, he used to play with us. One time, I remember a lunch. I don't think it was that day, but one of the luncheons of the days that we were out there, he, uh, they brought food out to us that uh, was, that was, it, it looked like a sort of a piece of, uh, two pieces of bread that had been waved in, in the near proximity of a jar of peanut butter. It sort of had a, bit, a brown stain on it, but it was mainly just bread. And that was what we had for lunch, that and some water. And Norman and I looked at each other like this, and, Suddenly we were both laughing. These things are 
The guru's ways, he has many ways, and he de deals differently with each one. But it was his way of teaching us to be even-minded. Whatever comes of itself, let it come. And so we passed those tests. I hope I passed other tests, but this is an essential thing on the spiritual path. Don't think, oh, I want this and I don't want that. And don't get upset when your dinner's a little late. Um, I've seen people talk about how dispassionate they are and they get all angry because somebody spilled some coffee on their tie. Learn to take whatever comes of itself, pleasant, unpleasant. Develop that detachment in your heart where no matter what it is, you just accept it. It's not that important. Now, when you have that attitude, you find that under all circumstances, you can be joyful. And this is what it's really all about. You see, many people think that the spiritual path and the path of dispassion is a matter of becoming sort of cold and indifferent. No, it's not that. It's that you feel joy no matter what. That joy fills your being. And uh, you can feel joy when things go well. You can feel just as much joy when things go badly. And you know that period in my life when I was, it was a period of great suffering for me because to be thrown out of my guru's path by my guru Bhai is not by him because I had been trying to serve him and they didn't understand me or what I was trying to do and I think they were just afraid of what I would do next, whatever it was. My whole life was dedicated to that. I was, it was that or nothing as far as I was concerned. So you can imagine that suddenly not being allowed to do anything until I found that he himself had told me what to do and I did that and wrote books and so on. But for a time there was intense suffering. I would lie on my bed and look at the ceiling and just think, I wish I could die. I wish God would take me out of this body, but he didn't, so I had to go on. But you know, I discovered over a period of time that the pain that I was experiencing was superficial. Underneath that, there was joy. That joy never left me. You remember in Autobiography of a Yogi where, where when Sri Yukteswar left his body and our guru said, uh, what pain he had felt. Of course, he knew it was all illusion, but still, masters too go through these things to help us to see. They go through human emotions, human experiences, to, to help us to know how to respond to these things. But he said that under the sand of all that, there was that constant river of joy. It never left him. This is what we need to seek in ourselves, that no matter what, if you really are... Um, Calm, and if you really, if you meditate regularly, you'll reach that point in yourself where no matter what, death itself won't bother you. People have tried their best to get me rattled. It just, I just let it be, because I felt nobody can take away the joy and the love that is in my heart. That's all that matters. Now, suicide is one way but a false way of getting away from it all. The truth is you don't get away from it all. You come back into a body sooner or later with the addition of that bad karma of destroying this good opportunity that you were given. This body is the temple of God. Don't dishonor it. It's much, you know, this is a strange thing to say. It's worse karma to commit suicide than it is to kill somebody else. That doesn't mean it's not good. It's pretty good karma to kill somebody else. It's very bad karma. It's even worse to kill you. There was a movie that we saw. It was called The Light of Asia, um, The Light of India. And it was about the life of Gyandev or Gyaneshwar, who was, uh, as you know, a great saint of India back about 700 years ago. And his father had been a sannyasi and had left his vows, married, and uh, because of that he was thrown out of his caste. From a Brahmin he was made an outcast. And in order to expiate that sin so that his children would not have to bear that karma, he, was, uh, uh, he committed suicide. His wife joined him, they jumped into the river and drowned. And I said to Master, but if he was in a, a high soul, wasn't it bad to commit suicide? 
And my guru replied, not in that case. He did it with realization. You see, killing yourself under all circumstances is not bad. Killing yourself to get away from it, that's what I mean when I say that it's bad karma. If, however, you enter battle and are slain, for example, this is good karma. A soldier who dies in battle will go to heaven. He will go to swarg. He'll have to come back, surely. But this is, mind you, there are different kinds. It always depends on the, the motive behind your action. What you do with the desire to please God, the desire to help other people, the desire to protect the lives of other people, all these things are good karma. So when I speak of suicide, I don't mean um, all kinds of death. It means your own desire out of selfish uh, interest to escape this body and the tests of this body you will have to go through them. Remember, when you go to the astral world, you will have to come back until all your desires are expiated. I wondered about that once, but my guru said, pure desires can be satisfied in the astral world. A desire for beautiful scenery, a desire for beautiful music. You have more beautiful music there, more beautiful scenery there. So he meant more physical desires. Um, when you have any desire, share it with God. Even if it's a physical desire, share that with God. Feel that I'm doing this with God. Even if you make mistakes, Master used to say that God is pleased when you give that, that desire to God. He is pleased if you say that, that you are doing this through me. Uh, in that way, you may say, well, but it seems absurd to say that God committed sin through me. But he likes it when you do that, because if you make him responsible, you will feel his energy to the point where bit by bit, even if habit forces you to sin, even if habit forces you to do wrong, if you give it to him in that way, you will find bit by bit that desire leaving you until finally you are, you'll wake up one morning and discover that I don't have that desire anymore. It will come to you. It may come in a year, it may come in a lifetime. Don't worry, this is the way. The more you, I remember one time my guru was scolding me for being too intellectual and I said, sir, I want to change, but it's such a job changing your own self because your mind is already in that delusion. And so I said, uh, it's, it's hard to, I'm doing my best. He said, habits can be changed in a day. They are only due to the, to the concentration of the mind. You are concentrating one way, just convince your mind to concentrate a different way. And suddenly you'll find that you can change, you can be different. So don't allow the um, force of maya and of habit to say, this is who and what I am. No matter how strong your habits, no matter who you are, no matter how many sins you have committed. As the Bhagavad Gita says, even the worst of sinners, if he steadfastly meditates, speedily comes to me. Remember that. You are a child of God, and sooner or later, you have to become like the greatest master who ever lived. We all have to become one with God. So... This song, Lord, may we serve you all our days, have that attitude. It's a song I wrote for the life of St. Francis, but it should be our lives too. Everything we do, let it be in praise of God and in love of him. Joy to you. Lord, may we serve you all our days, ever rejoice to sing your praise. As we together your wisdom sing, Charge us with truth whenever we speak. Lord, may we ever know your will. Come to us when our thoughts are still. As we your guidance with joy receive, may we as one your bliss achieve. As we your guidance with joy